Good morning. And welcome to this time of worship. This is Chalmers Castle Downs United Church. Whether you are here in person or online, we're glad you are here on this uh, uh, sunny morning. <laughs> if you are watching online, we will be celebrating communion at the end of the service, so you'll want to pause the video and prepare something to eat and drink when it's time. I am Stuart Jackson, and for those who don't know or don't remember, I served here until my retirement eight years ago now. Good heavens. <laughs> and I've invite, invited, been invited to be here this week while Christian is on sabbatical. And I do apologize for not being here last month. I had to attend my father's memorial service in Vernon that weekend, so I had a good reason. Uh, and thank you for to Alice for scrambling to find <laughs> substitution. Also, welcome back to uh, Penny Stokes on the keyboard. <clears throat> Today is Father's Day, and so blessings and prayers to the fathers in our midst. It's also Indigenous Day of Prayer, the Sunday before National Reconciliation, or sorry, National... <clears throat> National Indigenous Peoples Day, which is June 21st. So we make time to recognize and celebrate the unique heritage, diverse cultures and contributions of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Although these groups share many similarities, they each have their own distinct heritage, language and cultural practices and spiritual beliefs. And so I invite you to join me in the acknowledgement of territory. The words are on screen in, in the bulletin. We come as pilgrims on this land, and so we affirm that we are one part of God's creation, that we gather together in the traditional territory of Treaty 6 First Nations, and in the traditional territory of the Métis Nation, that we must honor future generations by preserving this land. We come here with hungry hearts, waiting to be filled, filled with a sense of God's presence, filled with the touch of the Spirit, filled with new energy for service. May God be with us today and in all that we do. Amen. As we relight the Christ candle, we hear these words from Paul's letter to the Romans. Hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. Let us pray. In you, O oh God, every family on earth receives its name. Illumine the homes of this earth with the light of your love, granting courage to those who are hurt or lonely, endurance to those who care for sick family members, and wisdom to those in fearful times of change. We thank you for gifts of love we have received from mother, father, spouse, child, or companion. And so we sing together, number 218 in the Voices United, we praise you, O oh God.
Please be seated. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Isn't technology wonderful? We love it. Yes. All right. Oh, we'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> so the theme conversation should be. Ah, there was that slide that I was, that's the one I was looking for. <laughs> All right, so I have a picture on screen. To uh, any ideas on what's happening here? <laughs> Poor donkey. <laughs> Someone was told to travel light <laughs> and they got the message wrong. It's kind of one of those things. We try to pile so much on, and uh, that can be the result. We're not going to go very far, are we? <laughs> Donkey in the air like that. So if you are going on a trip somewhere, what might you need to take with you? And what might you need to leave behind? Hmm. Those are kind of the two theme questions that, that are raised by the scripture readings today. The... the uh, the first lesson is the story of Abraham and Sarah being called, and so they had to leave home and everything they knew and travel to a whole new part of the world where they'd never been before. What would they take with them? Well, everything, right? Because you, you know, don't know where you're going. You don't know what you might need. And then in the gospel lesson, Jesus sends the disciples, the 12 disciples out to on this first uh, mission and he says don't take anything with you <laughs> uh, just what you need to wear just your basic needs for today and trust that the rest will be provided by the people that you meet and you meet along the way so what if you were told not to take anything at all just yourselves just as you are and then again, what if the journey is simply how we live each day? God knows us just as we are and loves us just as we are. So it's important for us to remember that we are loved, appreciated, and important just for being who we are. So how much are you going to take on your journey? Let's sing together number 639 in Voices United, one more step along the world. i 
morning. Let us pray for understanding. O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. As the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, may we hear what you are saying to us today. Amen. Our first lesson. After calling them to leave their ancestral home, God promised Abraham and Sarah that their descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Today's passage confirms that promise. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 to 15, 21, and 1 to 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mam Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. Abraham said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little let me bring a little water <laughs> excuse me. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, <clears throat> since you have come to your servant. <clears throat> Abra Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, <coughs> Make ready some choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham took curds and milk and a calf, served the guests, and stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said, where is your wife, Sarah? He answered, in the tent. One of them said, I will return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were too old to have children. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have children? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord did for Sarah as promised. She gave birth to a son when Abraham was 100 years old. Abraham named his son Isaac, or laughter. Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would be a mother? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the gospel lesson. In the gospel reading, Jesus commissions the 12 disciples for their first evangelical mission into Galilee. A reading from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35 to 10, chapter 13, 15, 14. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were worried and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus sent out the twelve with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles, and do not enter any town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Do not carry any gold, silver, or copper money in your pockets. Do not carry a beggar's bag for the trip, or an extra shirt, or shoes, or a walking stick. Workers should be given what they need. When you come to a town or village, go in and look for someone who is willing to welcome you, and stay with him until you leave that place. When you go into a house, say, peace be with you. If the people in that house welcome you, let your greeting of peace remain. But if they do not welcome you, then take back your greeting. And if some home or town will not welcome you or listen to you, then leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Father's Day was first observed in 1910 in Spokane, Washington. After hearing a sermon about Anna Jarvis and the institution of Mother's Day the year before, Sonora Smart Dodd told her pastor that fathers should have a similar holiday. Her father was a Civil War veteran and single parent who raised six children. She thought he deserved some credit. So perhaps Father's Day today has become more of a hallmark festival, you know, the, the kind that are designed to make us buy cards for our fathers. But it does remind us to do what we ought to be doing year round, namely expressing appreciation for our fathers, our parents, and reflecting on fatherhood and parenthood from the perspective of our Christian faith. In the Gospels, Jesus often speaks of his relationship with God in terms of a father-son relationship. When he does, he uses the word Abba, which is the personal and familiar form of father, the equivalent of our daddy. Or if you speak like the Waltons, Pa. To Jewish thought in Jesus' time, that kind of familiarity with God was unheard of and to many, unthinkable. And even to many modern Christians, that kind of familiarity with, with God is uncomfortable. As the popular song puts it, God is watching us from a distance, and that seems to be our preference. I think we're more comfortable thinking of God in terms of other, as something far and remote and detached from our reality. God is the Holy One who sits in judgment on a great throne while we mortals grovel for mercy. After all, a God who knows us intimately, a God with whom we can have a family-like relationship, is also a God who has a claim on our lives, our actions, our thoughts. So perhaps we aren't that much different from the contemporaries of Jesus in that. In Hebrew thought 2,000 years ago, just speaking God's name was considered blasphemy. If you were reading scripture in Hebrew and came across the four letters for God's name, you were supposed to substitute Adonai, a rather generic term which means my Lord. Speaking God's name was too powerful, too much. I'll add a side note here about the King James Version of the Bible, which uses the pronoun thou to speak of God, and many people speak of the, the poetic language of the uh, King James Version. In our age, we understand thou with a capital T as a term of reverence, a 
again, putting distance between us and God. It's a term that, that puts distance between that familiar you we use with each other. However, four centuries ago, thou was the personal and familiar term of everyday language used to indicate intimacy. You didn't go around calling just every, everybody thou, only people you knew well. So just as Jesus used the personal and intimate word for father, the King James Version of the Bible uses the personal and intimate pronoun for God. However, in the context of Judea 2,000 years ago, Jesus offers a whole new way of relating to God. Abba, Father, Daddy. While we try to keep God at a distance, Jesus shows that we can know God in familiar, intimate, and personal terms. We can relate to God in terms we can understand. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Relating to an invisible spirit out there somewhere can be extremely difficult. To know that our relationship with God can be a little bit like our relationship with our parents, helps us know that God is close at hand and down to earth, approachable even. If we know what it means to be loved by a parent, then we can understand a little bit of what it means to be loved by God. And of course, I acknowledge that not all uh, parenting relationships are loving and caring. But this, we're talking about ideal situations here. By speaking of God as daddy, Jesus makes our understanding of God more personal, more intimate, more human-like, more understandable, more approachable. And at the same time, Jesus makes our notion of fatherhood and parenting a little more godlike, a little more holy. He sets a higher standard for all of our human relationships. This challenges us to think of our parenting and our grandparenting and all of our human relationships as potentially holy. After all, to call something holy simply means that it makes us more aware of God's presence. And when you get down to it, there's nothing more holy than loving human relationships. So our personal and family relationships can be signs of God's presence with us. Holy. The words we speak, the affection we show, the concern we express, the hugs we give can be holy. Not only can this change our view of God, it can change our view of each other. And it can change how we relate to each other. And all the while, we have the assurance that God is with us, offering us the love and support and friendship we need ourselves. The story of Abraham and Sarah, for example, is not so much about their faithful response as it is about God's relationship with humanity. The story is not so much about who Abraham and Sarah are, but about who God is about the claim God has on their lives. And so as we read their story, we need to look not for examples to emulate, not for heroes to worship, but for evidence of God's presence in the lives of ordinary, everyday people. If you know the rest of the story, you may have noticed that Abraham is not exactly a role model for fatherhood. In fact, he disowns one son, Ishmael, his son by Sarah's slave girl, and he comes within a ram's breath of killing his second son, Isaac, hardly a good candidate for father of the year. But Abraham and Sarah do respond to God's call ultimately, to God's promise. They become instruments in the birth of a nation, a chosen people with a personal and intimate relationship to God. 
In Abraham's day, it was asking the impossible and the unthinkable to ask a man to break his ties with his homeland. A man without a place was nobody. Where are you from? It's a good question. It was different for women, of course, as that we often find in, in history. They were expected to leave their families when they were given in marriage, like property. However, they still would not be expected to marry someone who didn't have any land. And childlessness was really the worst curse a woman could endure. So in contrast to the security of land and home, God promises Abraham and Sarah nothing more and nothing less than a new heritage. The promise that they will become a great nation is unbelievable, since Abraham and Sarah were well past childbearing age, we're told. And you don't have to have a degree in theology to see the humor in today's portion of their story. And yet it's a story with a powerful message. Sarah's cynical laughter is transformed to the grateful laughter of blessing. God makes a promise, which Abraham and Sarah don't believe, but the promise is fulfilled anyway. What else could they do but laugh? Well, and name their son, Laughter. Abraham and Sarah base their faith solely on some vague and unlikely promise, simply on who God is. And their story reminds us today that God indeed has a claim on our lives, that God calls all of us to be more than we are on our own. The story of Abraham and Sarah is powerful and foundational for us because it is the story of each of us individually and communally. It's the story of our faith communities. It's the story of our nations. It's the story of a tender, caring, loving, parental God who calls us to embark on a journey of faith. It's the story of ordinary, everyday people seeking to be faithful to God, who, like any good parent, embraces and nurtures and challenges and encourages us to seek our new heritage. Our lives, our communities, our countries, our churches are filled with divine potential. And because we choose to make the journey, the whole earth may be blessed. Let's pray. God of Sarah and Abraham, God of us all, throughout the ages you have called people to journey in faith. You have blessed us with the gift of your word, with the stories of faith throughout history. Bless our learning and our vision. May we move with confidence and hope toward the new heritage you offer us. We pray in the name of Jesus, our companion and guide. Amen. And let's sing hymn number 507 in Voices United. Please remain seated for, for this. Today we are all called to be disciples.
announcements. Good morning. Um, I would just like to announce that at the back, um, in the entranceway, there is a, um, a clipboard with um, people, uh, where people can write down if they are willing to read scripture over the summer months. We've got all the dates on there. So if you think of a Sunday that you know you'll be around, some of you may be ushering or whatever, please feel free to sign up so that we know ahead of time if someone is going to be able to read for us. And also this morning, we thank the Kennedy family for providing coffee and goodies at the back, so all are welcome to stay afterwards and join in with some, uh, with some goodies. And thank you for your uh, parting gesture as they leave for Cold Lake. The psalmist wrote, With what shall I return to the Lord for all this bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. With newness of life, we serve God by presenting our offerings. And I understand that the offering plates are at the back and you're welcome to uh, leave your uh, fun financial gifts there to support the ongoing work of Chalmers Casadellas. Let's sing together. The words are on screen for the gift of creation, the gift of your love. Sure. Should be singing showers of blessing. <laughs> for the gift of creation, the gift of your love. pray. God, by your generosity, we have received all that we have and all that we are. Teach us to use wisely the things you have entrusted to our care, so we may become more and more your children in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I thought it would be helpful to just offer a couple of words of instruction as we move into communion. Our communion prayers today are all adapted from a song of faith, which is one of the United Church of Canada's statements of faith. Also, we will be singing the Lord's Prayer, which using a setting found in the, in the uh, it's now the old green book. Good heavens. I remember when that book was new. <laughs> Uh, songs for a gospel people it uses a call and response format which means that i'll sing a line or a phrase and then you and the choir will sing it back to me <laughs> and it, it's a simple tune so don't worry about that it's a very pretty tune and uh, we are all invited to gather at the table with the uh, communion elements which hopefully everybody has if you haven't make sure you get them now before the from the ushers Let's join together in the responsive prayer of thanksgiving. God is holy mystery, beyond complete knowledge, above perfect description. Yet in love, the one eternal God seeks relationship. So God creates the universe and with it, the possibility of being and relating. God tends the universe. 
mending the broken and reconciling the estranged, God enlivens the universe, guiding all things towards harmony with their source. Grateful for God's loving action, we cannot keep from singing. We witness to holy mystery that is holy love. We find God made known in Jesus of Nazareth, and so we sing of God the Christ, the Holy One embodied. We sing of Jesus, a Jew born to a woman in poverty at a time of social upheaval and political oppression. He knew human joy and sorrow. So filled with the Holy Spirit was he that in him people experienced the presence of God among them. We sing praise to God incarnate. Jesus proclaimed and announced the coming of God's reign, a commonwealth not of domination, but of peace, justice, and reconciliation. He healed the sick and fed the hungry. He forgave sins and freed those held captive by all manner of demonic powers. He crossed barriers of race, class, culture, and gender. He preached and practiced unconditional love, love of God, love of neighbor, love of friend, love of enemy. He commanded his followers to love one another as he had loved them. Because his witness to love was threatening, those exercising power sought to silence Jesus. He suffered abandonment and betrayal, state-sanctioned torture and execution. He was crucified. But death was not the last word. God raised Jesus from death, turning sorrow into joy, despair into hope. We sing of Jesus, raised from the dead. We sing, hallelujah. By becoming flesh in Jesus, God makes all things new. In Jesus' life, teaching and self-offering, God empowers us to live in love. In Jesus' crucifixion, God bears the sin, grief, and suffering of the world. In Jesus' resurrection, God overcomes death. Nothing separates us from the love of God. The risen Christ lives today, present to us, and the source of our hope. In response to who Jesus was and to all he did and taught, to his life, death, and resurrection, and to his continuing presence with us through the Spirit. We celebrate him as the Word made flesh, the one in whom God and humanity are perfectly joined, the transformation of our lives, the Christ. Carrying a vision of creation healed and restored, we welcome all in the name of Christ, Invited to the table where none shall go hungry, we gather as Christ's and friends. In Holy Communion, we are commissioned to feed as we have been fed, forgive as we have been forgiven, love as we have been loved. The open table speaks of the shining promise of barriers broken and creation healed. In the communion meal, wine poured out and bread broken, we remember Jesus. We remember not only the promise, but also the price that he paid for who he was, for what he did and said the world's brokenness. We taste the mystery of God's great love for us and are renewed in faith and hope. Grateful for God's loving actions, we cannot keep from singing, creating and seeking relationship in awe and trust, 
we witness to holy mystery who is holy love. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever, now and forever, Amen. Bread, broken and given, we taste the mystery of God's great love for us. Cup filled with love poured out, we are renewed in faith and hope. The gifts of God for the people of God Come, eat, drink, for all is ready, and all are welcome to this table. Amen. You may partake. Let's give thanks for this meal. Holy mystery, holy love, may this outpouring of gratitude and awe indeed be holy. May this bread and this cup transform our lives, our relationships, and our world. May the shining promise of your open table break down barriers and heal creation. 
creating and seeking relationship in awe and trust, we witness to holy mystery, who is holy love. Amen. Let's sing, Go Make a Difference, 209 in More Voices. With the assurance of God's blessing, go into the world, dance, laugh, sing, create. With the assurance of God's grace, go into the world, risk, explore, discover, and love. With the assurance of God's love, go into the world, believe, hope, struggle, and remember. And may the grace of God deeper than our imagination the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit richer than our togetherness. Guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows. Go make a difference. Amen.